pastor or the preacher? The problem is, is that what our founders did? And is that what our founders wanted? No, it's like, they're like sheep. And that's, our founders thought you can't have a democracy if people think like that, right? Mm. Remember the article we had, the virtue of an educated voter? Mm. They don't want people to be sheep <laughs> because that's what happened in Europe. Um, and they also knew they were being demonized by, they were being demonized by the people in Europe. But they, when, if you come over and you become an American citizen, you should value religious toleration and you should value the um, use of, of science and a science of government to promote human well being. So, you know, the people came over here for opportunity and because they valued it, you know. Um, instead of condemning it. What do you think, Melanie? Um, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not really sure. I don't really have, I don't have a comment on this one. I guess. So do you, but you said you self-identify, I think, as a secular humanist, is that yes. right? Yes. Well, are there people that think that you're selfish or degenerate? Oh, yeah. People, yeah. Okay. people are scared. Like, people are scared of it <laughs> to an extent. That's what I'm saying, right? This yeah. is, they're answering that. Yeah. Um, the U.S. founders, the USA had a humanistic origin, Thomas Jefferson, um, you're supposed to break the chains of, under monkish ignorance and superstition. Um, Abraham Lincoln, the preamble, they leave out, the preamble to the Constitution leave out God. And that, at the time, that was just a huge red flag, you know? How could you leave out God? <laughs> well, because we don't want it, you know? And, and just to have to watch Americans talk about, oh, our founders wanted God to be in, you know, in our public life. And no, they didn't. They did not. <laughs> um, Renaissance humanism. Um, that was the beginning of science. Uh, Renaissance is the rebirth of the Greeks. And so um, medieval Christianity, St. Thomas had, had, um, adapted Aristotle to Christianity, but in the Renaissance, they went back to a secular, to the classics, and those people were pagan, right? Um, but eventually, the classicists rejected modern science, and so then there was a big split there. Um, religious humanists in the USA, the Unitarians. How many of you know about Unitarianism? Do you know about Unitarianism, Jack or Melanie? Uh, I remember studying it freshman year, but I can't remember like what, what all it entails. Okay. Well, if either of you would like to do an advanced seminar paper just on the humanist tradition, it, it is something that I really think our founders would have wished that Americans would know about. You know, you can agree or disagree, but the ignorance about it is just crazy. So Unitarian means as opposed to Trinitarian, right? The Trinity is that Jesus is God, the Messiah. So their Unitarians didn't think Jesus was the Messiah, right? And they still sort of wanted to call themselves Christians. And of course, it's not true. <laughs> But, um, you know, they didn't want to get burned. They, they wanted to be respected. It's just that anybody with, you know, a Sunday school idea of what's going on and why it's called Unitarian would obviously say they're not Christian. But their view of God was consistent with science, Newtonian science. And so they are willing to change their religion to fit the science. 
And that is not, um, you know, not the stereotype we have about the people who defend our founding fathers, but that's the truth about them. Um, then it wasn't until 1961 that you, could, you couldn't refuse to hire someone because they don't believe in God. And the ethical culture societies, I mean, it's amazing. We had this huge, it was supposed to be this huge cultural renaissance, you know, where people would focus on ethics and keep the religion out of it, and keep all that bigotry out of it. Just be virtuous, you know, for its own sake. And then all these free thinkers and rationalists you know, it was going to be come to America and you can have a free mind, right? I mean, that was okay. So my dad had a big argument with his dad about what is America about? And my grandpa was a businessman. My dad was a minister. So my grandpa thought, oh, America is about opportunity. You can get rich in America. My dad said, no, America is about a free mind and you can think what you want and you can say it publicly as long as you're not, you know, yelling fire in a crowded theater. You can think about your, you can speak about your thoughts and there's no persecution. Um, so again, we have, we're rewriting our history and we're, I, I, Two thirds of the people in our country, I think, or more are fundamentalists. Like they reject evolution. <laughs> that is not. Our founders would be completely shocked that by now Americans weren't completely pro science. That it, it would just be very hard for them to grasp. <laughs> um, all right. So. Uh, Marxists. So this is what happened, right? Over in Europe, the aristocratic class, we, they had entrenched class structure. So then they started having these communist revolutions because the poor, the workers, were had nothing to lose. So they rebelled. Well, then that's how we got this idea that socialism, you know, is complete control of the government. And um, that's how we can, our politicians can have a minimal government intervention in capitalism. We can have this huge gap between the rich and the poor. And somehow that's American. And we can also refer to religion and God loves capitalism and and that is not what our founders had in mind. And it's not consistent with the way they thought. They really uh, they really wanted to maintain a middle class. And they would be very worried if America didn't keep setting up laws, institutions, values that would promote moderation in all things and a strong middle class, because they knew if you lose the middle class, you're going to have an authoritarian situation um, because people are going to be unstable and then someone's going to say they're going to fix it. Um, but anyway, what happened was this hatred of socialism. Um, and that's what's being used as a tool now to keep people down and to keep people so they don't pay attention to the shrinking middle class. Um, let's see, the Humanist Manifesto. All right, so each of you, did you, what did you think of the 1933 one? The religion can be manifested as dogmatic and anti-scientific, but it shouldn't be. I think that's how it is presented now in some like fundamentalist churches. Definitely. It, it, okay, that in some fundamentalist churches, religious religion is what? Is anti-scientific. Like yeah, anti yeah. It, all right, so they are um, 
religious humanism is the union of reason and faith, right? And that was Presbyterianism, Methodism, Episcopalian. Those were all the union of reason and faith. Um, liberal arts colleges that were founded in the first, I don't know, 100, 150 years of the US were all uniting reason and faith. So they do talk about that. Um, okay. It's just, I mean, they insist that whatever is religious cannot contradict science. What about you, Melanie? Oh, I just think that religion and science is so is so far apart like they I don't know I mean if you talk about religion really you can't talk about evolution like if you're religious basically God created all of us and that's the way it was and if you talk about evolution you're wrong <laughs> it's too bad Melanie because the Catholic Church accepted evolution um 50 years ago or more 70 years ago as did the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians and the Unitarians and the Quakers. It's just that a lot of Americans don't know that, right? And they don't know that our founders were intellectuals and they accepted evolution or they would have accepted it right away, no question, because they like scientific method. Um, so I think it's worrisome that Americans grow up now with these assumptions about the worldview that are, it's absolutely the opposite of what our founders had in mind. Does that make sense to you, Melanie? Yes. Okay, so I, I think moving forward, you, you need to know this because when people say that, you need to be able to say, it's not true, you know? As a matter of fact, our founders would have accepted evolution. Um, what about the 1973 one? Did you have a thought about that and how it's different from the 1933 one, Jack? Um, I didn't really know how it was different, but um, I saw a similarity, similarity um, that authoritarian religion rejects science and the development made possible by it um i just think that's a big problem that um like they don't have to reject science but they make the conscious choice to do so okay yeah um what about you melanie um uh, i just i guess i thought this one was more against religion yeah i think so <laughs> um like where it says um, now religion has become concerned with social action and um, this distracts humans from present concerns, from self-actualization and from rectifying so social injustices. And I think like now, a lot of times people just say, um, you know, God will handle it or give it to God. And they just kind of forget that we have to make a change, you know, God isn't going to make a change for us. And our founders definitely were that way, right? They're literally creating a whole new country um, in the belief that that's what God wants us to do, right? Use our minds, use science, use social science to make the world a better place. And so, yeah, and that's, that's worrisome. And again, it's worrisome that you all hear that so often and it's taken as fact or you know this thing about our culture and it's not it's like the opposite of what our founding was um and then the other issue here is technology is emerging and it's becoming a big issue right and that's true but it's also you know if people say we've got to stop putting carbon in the air and we've got to go from technology that was carbon based to green technology, right? So a lot of people are saying that, the people who are following what our founders had in mind would say that, but other people are saying, oh, well, you know, 
All you have to do is turn to Jesus and you'll be saved. And we don't have to pay attention or it's somehow God's will or it's I'm not responsible. Um, what do you, any reactions to that, Jack? I think we're responsible for our own actions. I don't think it's up to God to like, decide that for us should we be going green yeah i mean well yeah but it's i think that like electric cars the lithium extraction is is also dangerous so i mean going green means find another way right yeah. i mean nature really doesn't care <laughs> i mean nature is gonna fall apart if we put carbon or, I mean, no, find another way um, to get non-carbon emitting transportation, hmm. uh, right? Or, and if lithium's a problem, find another way. Hmm. Does that make sense, Jack? Yes, ma'am. I don't think it, it'll be the end for like renewables. I think they'll just, I think they should just keep trying to get better. I think that's the spirit of science anyways. Well, Bill Gates finally decided that in 2006, which is way, way, way too late. Um, I think he thought the market would take care of it. And he's totally wrong. He didn't know fossil fuel billionaires would control our political campaigns. Um, anyway, it's a problem. Um, social culture, right? How, how are we going to deal with the social culture? Um, reason has to be tempered by, so getting a culture of critical thought, right? Do you think we need a culture of critical thought? And do you think we're moving in that direction or are we moving in the opposite direction? What do you think, Jack? I think we're moving in the opposite direction. There's like, less less people going to college more people are like joining the workforce and i don't think like people really think critically about things like they should going to college and then also liberal arts colleges are dying right yeah. so if you have classes with 200 300 people that are just lecture classes um and then stem disciplines are more rote learning yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we are, um, I think history will say we're mm -hmm. in a decline, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think, um, like, like you said, STEM is like more of a focus now. And like in my STEM classes, we really don't think critically about anything. <laughs> we just like memorize stuff and do equations. It's not really talking out ideas. Even if eventually you become an independent scientist, would mean you make your own hypothesis and set up your own experiment, right? Mm. But that has nothing to do with questions like, you can do this, should you do this, right? Should we be using, should we be using our scientific knowledge to make this kind of product or doing this kind of research mm. versus that? Does that make sense, Jack? Yeah. They don't ask the ethical question. Right. They don't ask the ethical question, the cultural question, what kind of culture, because science is, is never separated from culture, even though when you study it, you study it as if it were, right? Mm. Yeah, it's kind of sad. Um, uh, Let's see, sexuality. Of course, there's a stereotype that these humanists are advocating all sorts of perverted and promiscuous sexuality. And the response to that is that intolerance and repression are bad, right? Um, and then, so what happens is we fixate on the humanists think we have a right to abortion and that's horrible. And we're killing innocent people. And that's why we have so many gun shootings is because we made abortion legal. So we don't care about human life. 
And it's just way, way too simplistic, uh, but it sells, right? Politicians can appeal to it. Um, so, you know, the vision is an open and democratic society, participatory democracy. Um, do you think Facebook is a good example of participatory democracy? No. It could have been, right? It could be. Hmm. But it doesn't seem to be having that effect. Does that make sense? Hmm. What about you, Melanie? What, what did you think of this point? Anything in it? Um, are we on, we're still on 10, right? Yep. Um, honestly, well, you asked if I think, if we think that an intelligent society is important, I think. And I think it's very important. Um, I think that we're kind of at like a peak of people not critically thinking. Uh, I hope down like I, I think it'll be that way for a few years, um, for a few more years, a decade maybe. And then I hope that my generation, once we get older, will be able to change that. Because I feel like a lot of the people I talk to now, maybe that's just because I'm at Lion right now, but I mean, we all know that the world and government is kind of messed up right now in a negative way. And we, I mean, we all want to make a change. So I just hope that we can. Okay. Um, there are people getting paid to go onto college campuses and advocate conservative values, right? Um, there's just a lot of money in politics these days. Uh, then the other thing, do you remember Aristotle's virtues? The most basic ones were temperance and courage. So pleasure. And so there is a tendency to obsess about sexuality and to be so obsessed about it that you don't notice the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, the lack of access to education and healthcare. You know, none of these basic middle-class human well-being values get focused on because everybody's obsessing about sex, somebody's sex life. Um, and the humanists, you know, they say, just let adults make their own choices, right? And educate your children so that they're, they don't abuse somebody sexually. So they link sex to long-term commitments, but just making things illegal, repressing, projecting, demonizing, that doesn't solve anything. Um, but, and it makes political life very dysfunctional because then politicians can punch those buttons and behind your back, they're all doing whatever they want to do anyway. It just makes, gives politicians tools to deceive the public. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Political culture between nations um nationalism versus internationalism uh so the humanists want us to think about an international order to appreciate pluralism and diversity to you know prefer our common humanity over national pride uh cooperation nat natural resources economic development okay so that's this is uh 1973 is when i was in college so um, it is amazing to me that um, those values have declined a lot, um, even when the world needs them more than ever. So that's, that's hard on me. <laughs> um, so let me see, there was, uh, what else was I, what was this one? Um, oh, no, this is just a smaller version, but um, this one is more like a summary of the reading. Um, so you could, you could understand that. Um, 
All right, and then here's a quote that I just added. So this is what happened in 2002. So here's what happened after 9-11, okay? Um, he wrote an article um, that the White House didn't like about um, Bush's former communication director. Um, I had a, oh yeah, okay. So the Bush people didn't like his article. So they had a meeting with an advisor to Bush. He expressed the White House's displeasure. He told me something at the time I didn't fully comprehend, but which I now believe goes to the heart of the Bush presidency. And this is right after 9-11, right? The year after. And he's writing this in 2004. The aide said, the guys like me were, quote, in what we call the reality-based community, people who believe the solutions emerge from a judicious study of discernible reality. I nodded and murmured something about the enlightenment principles and empiricism, which would be our founders, right? He cut me off. That's not the way the world really works anymore. We're an empire now. When we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too. And that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you will be left just to study what we do. Okay, guys, is that what's happened ever since then? We have this whole narrative about what's a fact, alternative facts, people creating alternative worldviews, right? Fox News versus um, MSNBC versus CNN versus, right? People, they are truly just making stuff up. And we're an empire and we can do it. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think that that's the world that you're in is behind the scenes? There are people with that attitude that are just making stuff up? Yes. Yes. Okay. Again, if you, I would love to have each of you, you know, I guess if you're going to major, you'll have to write an advanced seminar paper. So you can write a paper on what happened in the Bush administration and how this whole um, political rhetoric uh, making up of facts was a big deal. It was the um, plan. It was their plan for winning an election. Um, for example, did you know that um, in 2004, there were there was what was called a marriage amendment put on the ballots of four, 11 states. Um, did you know about the marriage amendment? No. Okay. Well, I, I think this, I mean, it is terrible also how, of course, you don't learn history. It's not your fault. It's just a combination of it's not in the schools and you don't sit around the table and talk to your parents about it and stuff. It's not their fault. It's just become part of the culture that we don't create, you know, we don't try to find out what's the context within which you're stepping into history. So, all right. So in 2002, 2003, somewhere in there, all these um, Gallup polls or focus group, focus groups, were um, convened to find out what do you have to tell people to win the next election, okay? And this is the kind of thing that goes on. Um, for a while, the Republicans wanted to cut the inheritance tax, right? And um, in a democracy, Aristotle thought an inheritance tax was really important because otherwise you're gonna have this uh, entrenched wealthy class. And Aristotle said, you've got to always be fighting against that. 
if you want a democracy or a stable society. So um, there, there was this tax. If a, if a wealthy person dies with a whole lot of money, then the government gets it. So it's a motivator to contribute to philanthropy, to give back to the society. And there is an argument for that somebody who got rich would be more enlightened about what sort of organizations to give their money to than the government would. Well, fine, you know, give your money away and you get this tax break. Um, but during the 50s, if you didn't give your money away, there was a 91% tax, right, on wealth. And then under um, Nixon, it was 75% it was under Reagan, it was 50% maximum tax bracket. Under George W, it went to 35%. And under uh, Trump, I think it went to 18%, right? So we're having this huge concentration of wealth at the top. Um, but they took, they had a focus group and they said, well, what do you think? Would you vote in favor of an inheritance tax? Oh yeah. What about if you call it a death tax? You're gonna tax people on death. Would you be in favor of that? No. Okay. Then they go out there and they call it a death tax. <laughs> The Republicans are against the death tax. Yay, I, I agree with that. Do you understand that? That that's literally what they're doing. They're creating this whole made up reality. This is rhetoric. Totally, right? Focus groups. Um, so then they figured out that in 2002, 2002, they figured out that the way to win the election, people were anti-gay, how to get Southerners to vote Republican, uh, just demonize non-heterosexual relationships, right? They, you know, how many of you think homosexuality is bad? You know, how many of you would vote based on a politician that condemned homosexuality? Chong, okay, that's what we're gonna do. Um, before that, in 2000, Mr. Bush, his platform was called Compassionate Conservative. And he said he would want the government to have civil unions. And that's what they have in Europe, is that you get a civil union, you get all the tax breaks and all the rights, all the benefits. But the church does a marriage and the government does civil unions. So in Europe, you have two different ceremonies. Um, and also, Laura Bush said she did not want Roe versus Wade overturned. Okay, so that was compassionate conservatism. Um, the Roe versus Wade thing was this belief the Republicans don't want government in my bedroom, right? They don't want government to be powerful. And so that was sort of their argument. Libertarianism. I have a right, you know, keep the government away from that. It makes it too powerful. I have a question. All right. Yeah. So why do you think there has been a shift then towards like complete anti-abortion now? Oh, because of the rhetoric. Okay. After 9-11, um, they would take these focus groups, right? And so then they found out people will vote on the basis of if the politician tells them he's anti-gay, right? doesn't want rights for those gay people. All right. Well, so they ran that campaign, campaign, and it was a huge campaign. And they put the marriage amendment on 11 states that were within four points of going one way or the other. Arkansas was one of those states. So I, I voted, right? I saw that amendment there on the ballot. And every single one of those states went for Bush. Now, Mr. Cheney, the vice president, has a gay daughter who he's very close to. She was in charge of his political campaign in 2000, Mary, Mary Cheney. So this is completely cynical, right? They don't believe it. 
It's all based on fo focus groups, whatever. You just tell people what they want to hear to win elections. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the same with abortion, right? Just tell people what they, you, I mean, Cheney, Ivanka Trump, if she wants an abortion, she'll get an abortion, <laughs> no question. The only people who suffer when it's illegal are, are panicked teenagers and panicked poor women that just know I can't have another kid or I can't, I can't let my parents can't know I'm pregnant, I'll get killed. Um, so they panic and they go underground and they, some really, really wicked people <laughs> will charge them and butcher them. And that's all that happens, right? There are actually more abortions when it's illegal and they're dangerous. It's just, as a policy, it's totally worthless, but it works to get votes, all right? So, um, during the, Laura Bush, okay, after 9-11, Laura Bush, nobody talks, we completely forgot about what they said before. And you create this whole new image of what the Republican Party is because it sells and it worked. Um, so the Republican Party didn't used to emphasize religion because again, that would make the government too powerful. This is an empire-based view of religion to have an official state religion. The Republicans were not in favor of that at all. Um, anyway, that's what happened. It's just um, exactly what Susskind, what that aide said. They just did it. Then afterwards, Lynn Cheney, Liz Cheney, um, Cheney's daughter, she, you know, she's on the January 6th committee. Do you, all, do you know about that? Mm -hmm. She and one other Republican have agreed to be on this committee to condemn the people that stormed the Capitol. Um, and she's in a lot of trouble with her party. They're gonna get rid of her. But she ran, she was running her campaign in Wyoming and she was losing. Um, so she, she went out there and said, well, you know, my sister's gay, but I was always kind of uncomfortable about that. You know, she completely lies about it. And she won, okay? And then they interviewed her parents. Well, what do you think about your daughter? Well, we didn't have any problem with it, which is exactly the opposite of what was going on in 2002, right? And... Mary finally wrote a book and in, included that, you know, I got used, right? I got used um, politically by my family, but nobody reads, nobody knows this stuff. It's just, I find it kind of annoying because um, I just think you should know, right? If a politician is just being cynical and just punching your buttons, and they don't care at all. All they care about is getting rich. That's it, or powerful. They don't care about truth. They're not leveling with the American public. Um, and I, you know, I'm perfectly fine with finding examples on both sides, but I just, I don't know of that. I don't know of examples on the other side and I'd be perfectly happy to hear some, but I think it's really gotten out of control. The Republicans used to be a lot different than they are now. And I used to love to think about public policy. I love thinking about it um, because one side would say one thing and one would say the other, but I can't, I remember thinking, I just haven't heard of any Republican policies lately. Um, so what I thought, I, I guess now that there's time, I'll mention this. Um, what I did during COVID is I decided that I don't want to write articles that are exactly like I always used to write. Um, so I read a bunch of books. Um, 
and I wrote outlines of those books. So I want to just, okay, let me see if I can figure out how to get these books. Oh, I can do this here. Um, and I made a, an outline. I think I attached this. Yeah, reading group. Okay, so let's look at this. So if you are, you know, you're both philosophy major, take a lot of philosophy. Um, these are the books that I read. And um, again, I, you know, I, it's hard for me to see if I'm just really biased, but I wanted to find stuff out. And so I scanned about 40 pages. I wrote some outlines. And if any of you want to read the scanned part, the outlines, if you want to have an office hour, right? You can have friends read the stuff. I really, liberal arts education is all about reading and talking about this stuff, right? So the color of law is really important because African-Americans have not been able to get houses where the loan is amortized, which means every month you pay some and part of it goes to the bank and part of it goes to the principal. So you develop home equity. Most middle-class people's wealth comes from that home equity. My family's wealth came from that. I put my kids through college with the equity on my parents' home, okay? African-Americans have never until very recently and still it's very difficult been able to buy homes in neighborhoods that have that, that have amortized loans and also the value of the house goes up. So when I lived in Minneapolis, the value of the house would go up 15,000 bucks a year without, you know, just <laughs> in the equity. You didn't do anything, right? And and we're just middle class, you know, and when you're rich, it's way more. But um, so they were never allowed to move into neighborhoods like that and to have those kind of loans. And they, I mean, it's just the history of it is just mind boggling. And so of course you have these ghettos. That's not because they're lazy or stupid or violent. They've been forced into this. And over history, a lot more white people have had housing projects made for them than black people. So that stereotype is totally wrong. Anyway, then I read some stuff about qualified immunity because of the George Floyd. And then I have originalism, Amy Comey Barrett, the, what it means to go back to the founders. There were no, it was freedom to, treat your land any way you want, right? Environmental wise, of course there weren't any because there weren't any environmental problems. But originalism, it's just a horrible problem. And then the, the other side of it is people who think the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment radically changed the United States and our legal system needs to start there, right? because it included sexism and racism. Anyway, then there's one about how the middle class has been shrinking since Ronald Reagan. And that, to me, that's really important. That was when my youngest daughter was born and I lived through that and I've watched it. I've been horrified by it. Then there's one about um, Anne Applebaum was friends with Laura Ingram. And she tells the story of how her friends have joined up with people in Hungary and elsewhere to become part of authoritarian governments, anti-democratic governments. And that's an interesting story. Then something how to think about the post-pandemic world and how to envision, right, uh, Melanie and, and Jack, how are we going to envision what we're going to do going forward? And that's, you know, I like that stuff. Then there's one about the story of our torture program, 350 pages and, you know, it's COVID. This is my one chance to do this. I did want to follow through on that. It's depressing, but at least I read it. And then um, Cokeland, Charles Coke, he's the one who started this huge uh, political machine 
that pay, spends billions, billions on political campaigns, all the way down to um, city councils that if you bribe, you know, pay for the city council person's political campaign, they will pass a law that allows you to build your oil refinery in the area of that town or whatever, where they want to build it, right? So whatever they want to do, they just pay for some city council people in the next election and get whatever they want. Um, but it, it goes further than that, dark money. So I, I do think you should know about where all this money is coming from and why the legislature uh, you know, acts the way it does. Um, environmental issues, that's what I think is the biggest issue. So I read a lot of books about that. Um, Aristotle in the UN, uh, Melinda Trump, um, uh, The Power of Lift, so I'm writing about, I'm writing a, my own book kind of about what she says. And then uh, climate disaster, Bill Gates. Uh, Merchants of Doubt is really important that how a very small group of people have set up this campaign to get people to doubt environmental stuff, even when it's not <laughs> dubitable, right? Every Every climate scientist, every scientist agrees, but we've got this whole thing going, this rhetoric. And so it tells the whole history of that, which I think was really interesting. It's depressing, but it's interesting. Um, and then the takeover of our political system. Um, the, the book Imposters is really interesting because it explains the Republican policies and um, Antitrust is interesting because her big thing is monopolies and the history of monopolies. And that's really important issue in our country right now. Um, the best people is who Trump put on his cabinet. And I vote on the basis of who I think the, the person running will put on their cabinet because we could pass all sorts of environmental laws, but if, the president put a person in charge of it who actually had been sued a couple times by the EPA and is doing everything he can to destroy it, right? It doesn't really matter that the laws were passed. And that is what Scott Pruitt did. Um, and um, let's see. So Betsy DeVos, whatever else you want to read, I would I did scan quite a few pages about Betsy DeVos and the education because that's where you know you have skin in the game, right? Is education. So whatever else you know you do or don't wanna read, I would recommend that. Um, she was a rich billionaire's daughter who went to a hyper Christian school and she's in charge of our public education system. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, this one is about our food and it's addictive and it's so unhealthy. And we literally are addicts and we have the same kind of chemical reaction that an addict has. I don't eat that stuff anymore and it makes a huge difference. Um, anyway, and then what universities owe democracy, that's of course a big issue. I think that's really important. What, what students in college should be learning so they can think critically. Um, Let's see, and that's that's it. Um, so you can look that over if you want. Um, I would be happy, you know, to meet with students, and you get to you get the cheat sheet, you know. I just do. You, do you understand why? I guess I want to do whatever I can so that my students are educated voters. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, Anyway, okay, Melanie, does that make sense to you, Melanie? Yes. And if you, you know, if your parents are Republican and you, you ask them, what's the best thing you would want Dr. Beck to read, right? I really, I'm not happy about the fact that I, I can't find stuff, but I did follow the Bush administration and I have two 
bookshelves worth of stuff that he did, his administration did. And it's not pretty. Um, so, you know, I don't want this to be true. And if you know of something you think is really good about Republican policies or whatever, that would be great. I would like to know that. Okay, so we'll see you next time. Bye, Dr. Beck. Bye-bye.